I'm Jan Eckhoff. I'm the mother of Staff Sergeant Joshua Eckhoff. His dad was involved with veterans, Vietnam veterans mostly, and so Josh grew up going to all the parades, and so he says he's always loved the military. I'm Annie Remsburg, and I am Corey's stepmom. I'm Craig Remsburg. I'm Corey's dad. On his 18th birthday, at 5.30 in the morning, knock at the door. I go down, and it's the Army recruiter, and he's picking Corey up that day, and Corey signed up to be an Army Ranger that day. We are the parents of Chris Van Etten. I am Lee Van Etten, and this is my husband, Mike Van Etten. Well, of course, you know, both of us did, um, served in the military. I did 26 years, she did 24 years. Um, his grandfathers um, all served in the military. His great-grandfather served in the military, so yeah, it's kind of a, a family thing for us. I'm Julie Stambro. I'm Todd Nicely's mother and caregiver. I'm Michael Stambro. I'm Todd's stepfather. First time Todd told me he wanted to join the Marine Corps, he was still in high school, but he was going to graduate early. I was against it. I didn't want him to go in. Um, mostly probably selfish reasons. I didn't want him to leave and things like that. He couldn't tell us anything about what he was doing. We were totally in, in the dark about what he was doing. All I could tell us it was a very high value, very high value mission. When he left for Afghanistan, I wasn't as nervous as I was for Iraq because Iraq seemed to go so smoothly. I didn't know how really how bad it was over there. Just before Corey deployed on that 10th deployment, he had come home for a visit with the family. And he had shared with his dad that he had a very bad feeling about this deployment. So while I wasn't afraid of him being in the deployment, because that's what he joined to do, that's what was in his heart. The hard part for me was I had an intuition that this deployment was not gonna end well. I came home from work, pulled right into the garage, got out like it was just a normal day. John met me at the door and brought me in here and there was an officer standing in here. And our youngest son was at home and he came and let the dog out and he comes running back in and he says there's seven Marines out front. And I said, no, don't tell me that. They don't send officers to your door to tell you your son's been injured. So it was all very confusing. And during my initial presentation that afternoon, I got my cell phone went off and uh, normally I would disregard it, uh, but I saw it had some extra digits on it, which told me it was a satellite phone call, knowing Corey was overseas. I called her, I said, Julie, you gotta come home. Because why, what's up? I said, you just have to come home. And when I got to the phone, I could tell in his voice that there was something wrong. And I went into the uh, mode of, hey, Corey, how you doing? Thinking it was him, and it wasn't. And the guy introduced himself as Corey's company commander. Uh, at that point, at that point, you know, something went wrong. You know, they tell you, hey, we only call you if somebody's been killed, seriously wounded, whatever. So I was like, okay, what is it? And he said, I'm sorry. And I said, what? He said, your son has been injured. So I go back out and I look at Colonel Tomko and I said, you got to tell me, is he alive or dead? Because I need to know how to handle her when she gets here. He said, negative, one dead, but he's hurt really severe. And uh, he said, your son's been seriously wounded. Um, and went through and said he's AK, BK, and um, stuff like that. So I had to stop him just because she was, she was on the floor. I mean, she was losing it. I mean, she thought she had lost her son. He didn't even look like the same person because he was swollen and he had tubes coming out of every place imaginable. But I think the most horrifying thing to me was when they actually pulled that sheet back and just to see his body there with no arms or legs. One of Josh's mentors on the first tour, who didn't go the second tour, he got out. But he had been called from somebody in Iraq who told him that Josh was dead. And so Josh, it was, it was a very, very bad time. When you hear about the injury, you expect the worst. So to see that he was breathing, even though it was assisted, 
uh, I was relieved. This went on all night because if they didn't call me, I called them. It was just, um, and they never had, they never had very many answers. But they were, they were as reassuring as they could be. They were always kind. Um, Josh uh, did make it to Lonstool, and so they had told us that we would, um, he would be coming stateside as soon as possible, as soon as he was stabilized. In the, probably the first roughly six months, you're learning how to walk again. And that in and of itself can be very overwhelming and very exhausting. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine what he had to go through because it is a very, it, even now, just taking a step is a big thought process for him. It's not like us. Because they, uh, they thought he'd be, in, well, I don't know if they thought he'd be in a wheelchair, but it was expected that he wouldn't do very well. A vigorous uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech therapy, he just, it was just um, a long, long time. We only knew Chris came back home and he was going to some sort of dinner thing. We didn't know what it was, um, but we found out from our friend and then we had to ask Chris and then Chris kind of explained what the JCS was all about. The thing that I liked most about them was when they were the first um, organization to actually get in contact with us from our area. And they weren't pushy either, they just said, this is what we'd like to do if you're interested. It's really, it's really um, a very uh, a meaningful when just out of the blue you get a call from one of the JCS uh, leaders just to check up. Not asking for anything, not looking for something, just wonder how are you guys doing and can we do anything. You see organizations out there that talk a great game um, but don't live it. The JCS lives it and that's what really impressed me the most with them. They realize that there's more to, to what these wounded vets need than just a trip to go skiing or a trip to go here. They actually need something to help them feel normal again. If they know that you need or want something or something that will help you out, they'll do it for you without even asking. And so I'm comfortable knowing that along with his independence, he has JCS. If I wasn't here, he would have no qualms about calling JCS, many of the people at JCS. You know, you say the Joshua Chamberlain is a society. If you want to call it a society, it's a family. It's a small group, but it is a group that gives from their heart, and they truly become your family.